Today's guest is the much acclaimed computer scientist and mathematician Donald Knuth. Now, I don't even know where to start with a short biography of him. Widely regarded as the godfather of computer science, his multi-volume tome, The Art of Computer Programming, well, is kind of a big deal. He's won more prestigious awards than I've even heard of. But for many, his greatest blessing to the world is devising the omnipresent tech typesetting format, which has transformed the way mathematics is communicated. We'll talk about all that and plenty more in today's episode. But as is often the case, I found myself starting with the issue of name pronunciation. My name. Your surname. Yeah. That, that K looks like it should be silent. Well, uh, I have some second cousins who, who go by Newth, uh, but I figure you got only five letters in the name. You might as well use them all. Also, people say cunt, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> you know, they have d- dyslexia. Um, and and in maybe in that case, it would have been better if it, if it was a silent K. I don't know. But um, uh, yeah, I, I imagine you get to hear your name pronounced a bunch of different ways too. I do, I do. But Knuth is like what it always was. That's how your father pronounced yep. it. Exactly. And his father. I'd like to claim descent from King Knuth. King Knuth is, is buried in Winchester and, you know, famous... Uh, Famous as as one of the first Danish kings, and I got friendly with with a Count Knuth in in Copenhagen, who, who who's quite famous as being the man who knows the most about uh, the part of the world that's under the cap at the top of the. You have a globe, and 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 at the North Pole, there's a metal cap. He knows more about what's under that metal cap than anybody else, and and, and it's called Perryland. And when I knew him, he was 80 years old, and that was 50 years ago. So I imagine he's dead by now. Or in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> so anyway. He figured maybe some connection with the Australian branch of the family, you know, but uh, no, it's mo- it's most likely that my ancestors might have been serfs on land that belonging to to these uh, this Danish royal line. So the name it's a Danish word, is it? it? It's a Dan- yeah. If you go to the Copenhagen phone book, uh, there'll be I don't know how many hundred Knuths, uh, but eight of them will be count, you know, and one of the largest. Uh, I guess the third largest home in Denmark is Knuthenburg uh, Palace, for example. For those who are on a first name basis with you, who calls you Don and who calls you Donald? I was called Donald when I was a bad boy, when I was young. But when I was a good boy, they called me Donnie. I, you know, that was years ago. So I'm, I'm a little not. It's been a while since I've been called Donnie now. Um, the California style is, you know, and I imagine. Australian style s- similar is to, is to be informal and not and and, and not go by uh, uh, f- full name. But to me, Donald was always the more uh, Donald <laughs> uh, type of thing that when I I, that I, I, I should have watched myself. Uh, what does your wife call you? My wife, you know, it, it's funny, but. I don't think husband and wife really ever usually call each other by their names unless they, you know they, they don't know if the other one's in the house you know and and and, and I should say da yeah but but she she you know, I can't remember the last time she might have called me Donald. All right, so you get Don more these days, it seems like. Uh yeah, I don't think like if she she'll write a letter home and she won't she'll never refer to me as Donald. No, that I, I think that's because I've been a good boy maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me. What is something you would have done in your childhood that would have resulted in a Donald? I would have thought maybe you were a good boy. I was a wise guy. I probably made my teachers miserable. I remember one time in, oh gosh, in, a freshman in English class in high school, and we had a, a young, I'm not supposed to say female teacher, I'm supposed to say woman teacher now for some reason, but anyway, she was she was doing her first class, and we were merciless to, to her. I mean, we would push our textbooks and see and let them drop on the floor just to see what she would do, you know, and, and, and I thought I was smart, and we kind of sat back in the in, at the back, back of the class wisecracking with the other guys and, and the, I, I think my um, seventh grade teacher said I had a rhinoceros attitude I'm not sure what that meant that stuck with me that I had a rhinoceros attitude you think <clears> that is a compliment or I don't think so no <laughs> I don't think so I, I didn't feel I was being mean I just felt that I was I was enjoying myself, and and I, my friends and I would do things like write uh, newsletters and and radio skits, and uh, 
uh, th things like this. So we, we were always uh, pushing the envelope on, on things, and, uh, doing things that weren't assigned. But were you like, you were good at math? No, we had no, no, no math really. Uh, our teachers didn't know, uh, our teachers were incompetent at, at math. I, I had problem because uh, I proved that one equals zero and the teacher couldn't see anything wrong with it. And so, you know, so I decided maybe math is, is all wrong. But, but as a kid, that's still a pretty smart thing to be doing, playing around with proofs. And I was, I guess the best way to say it is, though, I, I was a, um, parents said, study for your classes, and I studied for my classes, and I, and I tried, but I also enjoyed it very much, and the thing I enjoyed most was English class, and grammar, and uh, diagramming sentences. We could take a sentence, and you would, you could make a chart, he goes to the store, and we would say, well, he, that's a pronoun, and and that's the subject of the sentence, and goes is the is the verb, and, that, and the predicate sentence, it goes to the store, and to is a preposition, and the is an article, and store is a noun, and, and you know, we have, a, my friends also, we would stay after school trying to diagram sentences that weren't in a book. So even though you loved English, it, it does sound like you were applying quite a algorithmic or like analytical mind to it. It wasn't that you loved the beauty of the poetry. and the Exactly. I was detail-oriented and meanwhile not knowing it, the way my brain was deciding to structure itself, turned out that later on it it matched computers very well. So by the time I saw my, my first computer when I was... Uh, 18 years old, it was an immediate uh, uh, rapport. If I'd gone back in a time machine, or if I was one of your friends in school, yeah, what would you have told me you wanted to do when you grew, grew up? Like, what, where were you? What was like a dream job for you? I was always going to be a teacher. My father was a teacher, and so I, I loved explaining to other people what I thought was cool. Well, I'll ask you one high school story because I read this. Yeah. I read this on your Wikipedia page, and it's a famous story, and I do want to find out about it because I think it's a good <laughs> story. What was it? Ziegler's giant bath. Oh, oh, that was that was eighth grade. Okay. Yeah. So that was uh, sort of indicative, I guess, of uh, of the kind of crazy person I was. Uh, there was a, there was a TV show. You have to remember, this is uh, 1951, let's say, uh, when television is very new. And it, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was, they had a, a pioneering museum and, and a guy who was very good at explaining science to kids. And it turned out that, you know, he went on and became nationally famous later, but he started out in Milwaukee and, and that year, they, they decided to, to run a contest for kids uh, to find out something to teach them how to use a dictionary, say. And the sponsor of this TV show was a Milwaukee company, the Ziegler's Chocolate Company. Milwaukee was famous for making beer, but the other thing that you could smell if you walk around downtown was chocolate. So the Ziegler Giant Bar was the sponsor of this TV show, and they got this great idea saying, oh, let's uh, see how many words can be made out of the letters in Ziegler's Giant Bar. And so I got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, for Ziegler's, and then there's eight more for so like sixteen. Yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot. And I also have an apostrophe, uh, so yeah, got a lot to work with there. And um, that fascinated me to realize that so many words could be made. And then the uh, prize was going to be a television set, not for me, but for the school, so we could have a television set in our classroom. <laughs> Uh, and also a candy bar for everybody in the class, and I get to go on TV. So that was the that was the incentive. Well, anyway, I thought it was <laughs> it was pretty interesting, and and my dad happened to have a unabridged dictionary at home, a, a great one of these great big Funkin Wagnalls dictionary that weighs like you know, I could hardly carry it, and. I realized that if I could zoom through fairly well, I didn't have to look at the letter D. There's no Ds in there. And, you know, and I've got two A's. I can go through and I look at the first word and it's A. The next word is AA. Okay, I'm still okay. And then there was like aardvark. Okay, fine. <laughs> no good. But but anyway, I made a little, little three by five card putting letters on it. And I, I could scan down and it didn't take me too long to run through the dictionary. And Because the idea here is, yeah, how many words can you make? How many words could you make rearranging the letters, uh, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, just choosing some some of the letters, and it has to come out at the right. I'm not allowed to use three A's, <laughs> okay. But I saw that it was going to take me a while, so I so I pretended that I was that I had a stomach ache, <laughs> and for two weeks I stayed home from school working on going through the dictionary. <laughs> 
Um, but you'd come up with like, I mean, you obviously I, didn't I, have a and computer. And I, I came up, I obviously didn't have a computer. Yeah. That was 1951. Yeah, but you'd come uh, up with like a computer, like com sort. Of. Yeah, right. there might have been six computers in the world at that time, and they were all millions of dollars. Okay, so, but uh, the thing is, I came up with 4,500 words at the end, and I still have the, the typescript at home. And the judges had only took 2,000 words. And so, uh, uh, well, I won the contest. And I got my big day on TV, and I, I looked back at it again uh, not so long ago, and I saw that I, I made a few mistakes, I missed a few things, but uh, it was still kind of indicative of the, the kind of mindset that I have, like, try to be encyclopedic and let's say digital oriented rather than continuous. I, I I knew nothing about how to you know build radios or things like that. That's that's a continuous world, but I, I I'm in the digital world, the not analog. Did the school get the TV? Yes, the school got the TV. Were and you like a hero? Were you? A we hero? got my my teacher would come in on Wednesday nights to watch the the wrestling matches. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we used it in, in class one time. There was a, a special event. Uh, I think it was, uh, what's his name, coming back from Korea in disgrace. Every once in a while, there would be a program from the United Nations or some, some amazing thing. Now they were, they were starting to... It was starting to be possible to have television that would go you know, across the country instead of just be local. But this was this was early days, you know, eight years before the Beatles. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> Did you own up to faking the illness? I'm not sure how how much my parents knew. My dad did help me type it up. So you finish you finish high school mm -hmm. um, with uh, successfully. Like were you like a top student? I, I, I think I I set the record. They were grading us on a numerical system, not A, B, C, but you you would get an, an exam. You would get 97 points or, or or something like that. And my average was I think it was. 98 point something. I mean, I, I, my parents told me to study and do well in classes and I, and I was obedient in that respect and, and I was acing my tests through high school. And besides that, I was editor of the paper and I co-editor of the yearbook and I was the manager of the basketball team and played the piano to accompany the chorus and things like that. I was, I was, uh, automaton doing what the parents wanted me to do. And what did your parents want you to do after school? Well, they knew that I wanted to be a teacher eventually. So, I, I mean, I had this idea that when I was in first grade, I wish I was a first grade teacher. I was thinking of being a first grade teacher. And then, you know, second grade, you can see the progression. Well, then finally I I got to college and I wanted to be a college professor. And, and eventually I was. We need to deal with how you got into computers. I know you've mm -hmm. told the story many times and people can go and hear you tell stories about first encountering a computer. You said you were 18? It was the 1956, so it would have been, I was born in 38, so that makes 18. Yeah, so so it was in the, uh, like, October 1956. Still, there weren't that many computers in the world, but this co particular computer was called the IBM 650, and it's the first ma mass-produced computer. It's the first time that there were more than a thousand made of any of any particular kind of computer. And IBM had this great uh, uh, idea that they would give these machines free to universities and get students hooked on it. Uh, and uh, so Case, the school where I was... I received its computer in October of 56 when I was a freshman. Was it kind of serendipitous or um, were you desperate to get your hands on it and see what these things could do? I had do? no idea what a computer was. In order to support myself in college, I, I had a job at the statistics lab. And the statistics lab is where the same building where the computer was installed and they had a sorting machine. I had been working with my summer job be before going into college was a, a little small printing company in Milwaukee. There was something called a mimeograph machine where you would uh, you would draw in stencils and oily ink would would go through the, this resin and, and print on the paper and you had to keep the paper uh, apart because the ink, the ink was, took a while to dry and so on. But anyway, I, I ran a little print shop in downtown Milwaukee and did the typing and, and illustrations for a bunch of little things, like short jobs for uh, this company. So I was used to working with typewriters and, 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 and keyboards and, and paper and cards and things like this. And so I get to, I get to college and I get, I learn how to put cards in a sorting machine. And and that was one of the things that you did in 
in the statistics lab in those days. So the sorting machine's on the second floor, and they installed this computer on the first floor, and it's it, it's kind of a big thing. It's behind a window, the door's locked, and so stuff like this. But lights were flashing on it, and so cases were very enlightened school. They allowed undergrads to touch everything. They didn't hire professionals to do it, but and so, so they had a guy there who, who uh, said, oh, okay, take a look at this machine, and you know, he shows me the manual for it, for it. And so I went home and read it, you know, and read, uh, well, how does this machine work? And before, well, <laughs> the great thing was that the, the manual was very poor. If it had been a slick manual, I probably would have said, oh, that's only for professionals uh, you, uh, you know, who have a special talent for this. But it turned out the manual was kind of dumb. I mean, the manual told how to solve some problem, and I could see immediately that the guy who wrote the manual hadn't read page five because there was a, a better explanation of how to do this. And so, anyway, I started to think then, well... You know, maybe I have a talent for this because uh, because I can do something that's better than what's in the manual. And pretty soon I was allowed to uh, stay with the machine all night and push all the buttons. Anyone who's no. worked with computers will know will know those moments when things go wrong, uh, something crashes or something. Yeah. You know, there's a mishap yeah. with your computer that you don't know how to fix. Yeah. This is like one of the first computers. You're like yeah. some guy who's never touched a computer before. Yeah. Did you have moments where like, you knocked the whole thing offline and thought, oh my God, I've just broken the university's new computer? Or were you always just completely in control? Once I almost got electrocuted, for example, uh, on the console of the, of the 360, there are little lights, I think they call them Nixie tubes, but anyway, they're tiny little lights about a quarter inch in diameter. And uh, that was our only way of reading out what's inside the machine. We could we could say display what's in location 100 in the lights, or we would control it through a console light. One day I was I was sitting there, I noticed that the, the glass was broken on one of the lights, and as a result, it wasn't lit up. I knew it should have been lit up, because I knew there was, there was supposed to be a number in there, so it was out. And so I figured, okay, the wires were there, I could pull them and, and pull the thing out, and then I could replace it by another Nixie tube. What a shock <laughs> when I when I touched that thing. Yeah. I didn't. I was so stupid. I'm thinking if it's not if it's not lighting up, it must it must not have a current in it. Well, you know that's that that's how digital I am in, instead of analog. You clearly had a brain that was just ready to get into computer science, right? And history has proven that to be the case. But if you'd been born. 20 years earlier, even 10 years earlier, maybe, and you didn't have that luck at university. You, you may not have become a computer scientist. What do you think you would have been? I don't know, uh, the, uh, the, but that's a great question because I, I, I really think that there were people who had the mind of a computer scientist. You go back a thousand years, you know, I, I can look at stuff and I can see that this guy, I feel a kinship to the style of thinking that people wrote down and vice versa. There are other the, the others who I think, I doubt if they would have resonated with computing at all. And I, I really believe that that there is this uh, different ways of, that, that people's brains are organized and approximately one in 20 <laughs> throughout my lifetime have had the peculiar uh, peculiar kind of brain that I do in a sense. So, so I, I, I look at myself as, as saying, well, you have a city with a hundred people in it, two of them are going to be like me. And I hope they know it because, because their skill is, is needed by the rest of the world. And so I write my books for the, for those two, but I don't try to convert the other 98. If, if you see what I mean. Okay. So, but that's why I think it's a great question. Otherwise, I, I don't know. I took aptitude tests in high school and, and I was high in um, architect and I was low in veterinarian. It feels like you could easily have been a mathematician as well. And you've had lots of, uh, you've studied some mathematics, you've had lots of flirtations and dalliances with mathematics, even through your computer science career. Why didn't you become a mathematician? In high school, my teachers didn't, didn't know math. So I had a very good, extremely good physics teacher. But the math I was exposed to in high school was only mystifying. And although I, I did enjoy, I spent many hours rolling dice I have to explain what it means, what a geek does, uh, you know, if he, if he doesn't have math teachers. And I had this um, little racetrack with six lanes, and you had six horses, a red horse, a green horse, and, and so on. And uh, it was marked off, and you roll a die, uh, and if, it, if you roll a three, then you get to move the horse three steps. And I spent hours and hours 
rooting for the red horse or something, but I would, I, but I was gathering data about how fast horses move if you roll dice and controlling their moves. And, and I, I kept it under my bed, this, uh, these horses, and I would run it the next day. But I, but I got to experience data, <laughs> okay, when I was uh, in high school. I also learned in math class that there was this concept of, of making the graph of a function. If the function is x plus 2 and x is equal to 3, then then uh, the value is 5. So, so, so I go over three steps to the right, five steps up, and I put a dot there. And the, and, and the function x plus 2, if I, if I draw it for all values of x, I get a straight line. And I learned that if you take x squared plus 2, you get a parabola, a n- nice curve. And I started playing with square roots. My dad had a calculator so I could compute a bunch of graphs using his uh, calculator was not like a not like we use now but it but it actually was mechanical and and it would it, it would go crash 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 and then print out after 2 seconds it would multiply two numbers together but anyway it worked and I could read the numbers off the tape and put another point on my graph and so I had orange graph paper for, for some reason that my dad had this extra paper around the house and I plotted all these curves on g- orange graph paper until my eyes started to hurt and I and that's when I had to start wearing glasses so I did before I got to college I was playing around with math on my own I learned about number systems so you know in uh, in our decimal system uh, 100 is has two zeros after the one and, but I, I learned that there's also binary system where where 100 means four instead of it because it's it's two two times two times two instead of ten times ten times ten so in high school I I thought well what if you had a number system where the base was pi instead of 10? And so I started playing with that. What if the number, what if it, the base was, was not 10, but one tenth and all the numbers go backwards? 100 is point oh oh one. Things like, okay. What if it's imaginary number, or a complex number? And so I did it. There was something called the Science Talent Search. Those days it was called the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Now it's called the Intel Science Talent Search. But there was a competition for high school students to submit science projects. And I submitted two projects in my senior year. One was a uh, number systems, a number system with imaginary base. And the other one was a science project which is another story that got me into Mad Magazine. But anyway, those were my two projects in high school. Why am I not sitting here interviewing a mathematician today? Okay, because I switched in 1969. I had to make a decision. In college, I I learned that that, that mathematics was much more to my own taste than physics. In physics, I could I could answer the questions, but I couldn't I couldn't understand why the teacher asked the questions. In math, I in math I I could think of questions that that would have been good to put on the exam. So I so I had I had an intuition for mathematics, and in, in physics I was it was more like I I was doing the best I could to follow the the textbook, but I didn't I couldn't intuit it very well. And also I flunked welding, but that's another story, because physicists were supposed to, well, we had labs as well. In our labs, uh, one of the worst cases, we had to measure the specific heat, was it specific heat or specific gravity? Anyway, we had we had to measure measure something, and, and my measurement was so bad that, according to the formula in the book, I had to report 150% error on my experiment. The lab says, okay, calculate your error, and here's here's the way you calculate it. And the answer was I was 150% wrong. And, and I didn't even like the, the formula because how can anybody be more than 100% wrong? <laughs> uh, mathematics was more appealing to me, and I switched in my sophomore year to be a, a major in mathematics. But you're not a mathematician now, so what? And I'm not a mathematician. I'm, I'm a lapsed mathematician now. And the reason is uh, computer science was invented about three years after I got my PhD in math, and I became uh, editor of journals in computer science, and I started to write books about computer science, and I, and I was writing software, and I was consulting to computer companies, and I was also teaching mathematics, Caltech, and then I, I had always felt, well, I don't enjoy moving, but I, but I figure I probably move once in my life, to some place where I would have tenure and then I would never move again. And so, so I got to the point where I'm six years past my PhD and I'm saying, okay, now I'm going to move. I'm going to choose the place where I want to spend the rest of my life and, and what am I going to be? And so uh, it got down to a short list and it was um, four of the schools were to be a professor of computer science and one of them was to 
stay at Caltech as a professor of mathematics. And, and I, in a sense, it was almost a no-brainer by then because computer science needed, there was, there was so much excitement going on. And on the other hand, I would sit in the back row of lectures in mathematics and more often than not, I would, I would say to myself, so what, so what? In other words, mathematics was getting more and more away from the kind of things that fit my own intuition and, and skills and, and, and getting further away. And uh, computer science was getting more and more appealing all the time. And there was a, there was a need for it. Something about working in computer science, even now, but particularly in those early times, I can see how it would be super exciting because it's because it's new and there are just frontiers mm-hmm. everywhere. But also, it hasn't got like history or tradition or a pedigree or legends of the past and oh, things that, like that. You haven't got like Gauss and Euler and that. Does computer science yeah. suffer for that? Is that something that makes oh, it less oh, rich? Oh yeah, you, you ask such such great questions. Uh, in fact, uh, it's quite clear we're the new kid on the block, and. Uh, but but I want to I want to step back a little bit and say that computer science and mathematics have a lot in common that's different from physics and chemistry, biology, and the other sciences, uh, and that is the physicists, the chemists, biologists have to deal with what's in the real world. Mathematicians, computer scientists, we get to set our own ground rules. We make up the, the worlds we want to study, and and so it it means that it's. It's easier for, for us because if we don't like one world, we can choose another one. Uh, I mean, for example, I, I, I knew astronomy would be very hard for me because I, I would live my whole lifetime without ever knowing if any of my theories was correct. I, I, I couldn't go, go off to the sun and I, I'd be burned up, uh, you know, if, if I got there. So I would be faced w- with uncertainty. But with math and computer science, since we're making up our own rules, we can please surround it and get an, and get a total answer. So that was, uh, uh, that, that was one thing. But math and computer science are, are also, although they're both man, man-made in this sense, not p- part of nature, the emphasis is, is quite different. For example, uh, computer science uh, rarely thinks about more than larger infinity than countable infinity. But a mathematician, a lot of mathematicians rarely think of anything smaller than countable infinity. Okay, so there's a lot of intersection between the two. But there's also I can feel when I you know when I'm putting on my mathematician's cloak or, or my computer science hat, I mean cap, whatever it is, uh, I feel like I'm using a different mode of, of operation. So to me, these were distinct. It's not the same for everybody. I, I, I've tried to conv- convince Bill Thurston, who was one of the great mathematicians. So I, I could never convince him that there was any difference between math and computer science. You've had quite a lot of success as a computer scientist, obviously. So I'm mm. sure you're quite happy with where you're at. But do you ever look across the aisle at mathematicians or go to one of their conferences and think, ah, oh, maybe I should have done that. It would have been really nice to solve the Riemann hypothesis or be, be doing that stuff. Do you ever, do you ever wish you were one of them? I go back and forth and have different uh, things that turn me on uh, to sharpen different tools. And I have to say that, that the, the things in computer science that I'm least interested in are the things that connect to Wall Street, to finances. So I'm not excited by things that sell. I'm no good as a consultant as to what's, what people are going to like or something like that. So m- my own concepts of what's beautiful are the, those of a pure mathematician who are saying something is beautiful because it's inherent that the pattern is just uh, to die for. Also, I find that mathematicians have changed dramatically so that they that they now, these talks we just heard at, at, at the symposium, all of them are, are, are saying how much more computer science is coming into the mathematician's world. I, I find now that I, it, I uh, subscribe to, say, 50-50 math journals, computer science journals, and I'm getting a lot more satisfaction often out of the math journal. It's, and it's partly, as you say, the history of the subject, because I love history. But also, I found as I mentioned before, that a lot of of mathematicians of the past, and not only mathematicians, but musicians and things on the past, were, would have been computer scientists if, if they had lived in these days. And so, so they wrote things that sort of got filtered out and nobody realized uh, uh, the beauty of what they were doing at the time, but now we can we can do it. So I so I find that actually computer science uh, has a, has a very rich history, and, and I, I I'm studying uh, Sanskrit and old Arabic texts, uh, and finding lots of uh, lots of cool stuff there that the people would would have been computer scientists. <laughs> 
have to ask you about typefaces, otherwise I'll get I'll get lynched. Because <laughs> and one of your great gifts to mathematics, I think, is probably is tech. Okay. For some reason, I find it strange that it's something you got into. But it's almost like someone who's really good at baseball spending a whole bunch of their time designing baseball bats. Like you're you're designing mm, the tools yeah, to be used yeah. by the people who do your job. How, how has this yeah, come about? How do you oh feel my. about it? Okay, so actually, it's not so strange at all. But but people did did think that I did it as an excuse to because it was getting too hard to write to write my books on computer science. And they said, Oh Don, after you finished with typefaces, are you gonna start looking at binding, you know? <laughs> and and so on. But no, uh, I mentioned that my job was running a print shop before I went to college. And in high school I was editor of the of the paper. In sixth grade I put out a, a newsletter f- for the sixth graders and I, and I got my friends to help me with it. In college I was copy editor for the campus paper and, I, and and I was editor of a science magazine. So I I was always into writing and, and proofreading. So uh, I, I spent a considerable amount of time looking at proofs of things that before they were printed. So I knew about about typeface type of things that did. And, and with with the art of computer programming it was the first uh, really reference book on computer science and computer science ne- needed new conventions of typography that up to that time mathematics was the hardest thing for typographers but typographers hadn't had to typeset computer programs before so I worked on the presentation in type of, of computer programs and I spent a lot of time like we now have typewriter type well I think uh, somebody would have discovered how important it was, but I, it was me who helped push it through into the journals of computer science uh, in the early days that we needed a monospaced font, like like a typewriter. Uh, so so, it's not really f- far away from my own uh, background at all. In fact, it's in a way I had, I, I had ink in my veins because my dad was a, <laughs> had a part-time job as a printer. How big a part of your legacy do you feel this whole typeface adventure is? Because I mm. find when I, like, when I told people today mm. I was speaking to you, a good percentage of the questions were about were about that. And when people come up to you and like, want to talk about your career, is that one of the big things well, that comes up? Okay, well, absolutely this is something where it affects more people because they want to communicate just as I do and they have the same I- desire to, to make their stuff look good as I did. So when I did this work... Uh, I, I had a need because the uh, publishing industry had switched and and the publishers weren't able to get my books in the second edition of my books to look as good as the first edition. The first edition was done by hand and no, people who knew how to do that no longer uh, were alive, And <clears throat> except in Hungary. And so I still had the Hungarian translation of my book was still looking good, but I didn't know what to do. So, I, so, so I, there was a need for me to solve the problem of how to get mathematics books looking uh, decent again. Uh, but then, uh, once I realized uh, that uh, other people had the same needs, uh, the first year, it, the system was for me and my secretary. Then there, they, then there was a time when there were 10 people who were using it, and then there was a time when there were 100, and then there was a time when there were 1,000. And each time, I, I had to add a little more to the system so that it would be more versatile. And finally, after 10 years, I, I also made it so that it could be used uh, in China and and, and places with alphabets that are completely different from the ones that I knew. I mean, do you consider it one of your important life works? Or was it just, oh, oh, or was it just something you had to no, solve? No, let, let me say, okay, you're asking me to brag here, and so it's, I'm uncomfortable. But <laughs> but but it is true that I'm proud of the fact that that I've that I've helped make so many books that wouldn't have been written uh, uh, exist now. And the nicest compliment I ever had. Uh, I was in Prague, and uh, a, a guy in, was introducing me to a, to a talk. And only a, a mathematician would probably appreciate this. But anyway, he he gives the following uh, logical statement. He said, "For all mathematicians X, there exists a mathematician Y, so that X has helped Y." But with Don Knuth. You can reverse the quantifiers. There exists a mathematician X, so that for all mathematicians Y, X has helped Y. And mathematicians know that reversing quantifiers is a big deal. And so this was, as I say, this was, to me, the thing that makes me, made me, it's the most wonderful thing anybody ever could have said to me. Very nerdy compliment. Yes, yeah. (laughs) Let me ask you about the art of computer programming. 
I won't ask you to brag again, but I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm I'm not one of the two out of a hundred people this book is written for. I've not I've not read it. I, yeah. I wouldn't understand it, but I am aware of how important it is in the field and mm. all the accolades it has mm. received. But the thing about it that amazes me is you started it a really long time ago, and it's still you know it's still going with new volumes coming out all the time. How do you keep it modern and relevant? Computer science feels like a field that would. Is, would be developing quicker than almost any other science by its mm. by its nature, mm. and you sort of started writing it in the sixties. Yep. I can't believe that something written in the sixties or the seventies or the eighties and that can still be like relevant now. It, it feels like you'd be trying to hold back the tide or catch up with the tide. What if it was mathematics instead of computer science? I feel like I, mathematics I, you, doesn't move as fast. Tell that's wrong. I, I, I mean, it, it's just that mathematics was around longer, but there are very few of the ideas in 1962 when I started that that I can say, oh, I don't have to write about that anymore because it's no longer of interest. It, it's it's cumulative. Um, and, and and I don't have to write about everything in computer science. I, I only promised to write about the things that I that I knew about uh, that existed in, in 1962. I, I try to keep up to date on on the current things in them, but I don't have to write about parallel pr programming. I don't have to write about uh, encryption. I I, I don't have I don't have to write about robotics. I don't have to write about uh, Chat GPT, uh, um, computer vision. Uh, but the, there's a lot of stuff that that was there, and especially. Uh, we still have numbers. We still do arithmetic. We uh, we do calculations on, on not only on numbers but on polynomials and power series and other high, higher algebraic concepts. Uh, we uh, uh, we solve combinatorial problems with uh, patterns that that are two dimensional, three dimensional, pa all, all kinds of of ways where there's zillions of possibilities. But we psych out that there that there still are some that that have amazing uh, amazing property. My my, so, my ignorance here is. Very high, so but, I'm I'm, I'm but, very happy to have it. Explained. So is it is what you're writing more kind of underpinning? It keeps changing, and I I have to subscribe to journals, and I have to and I have to rely on on networks of friends who tell me what I don't know because it's w way bigger than it, than I can do myself. But the other thing about art of computer programming is that it's since there is so much to cover, it's impossible to to make it for dummies to, to make it simple. Yeah, I think I I don't. Put anything in that I don't think is going to be interesting 50 years from now. I don't get it right all the time. But if you look at the volumes that are published now, uh, th there are some parts that are hardly ever read. And, and I tell, and I say, okay, I'll, next edition, I'm going to throw this out. And t people say, no, 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 don't throw this out because, you know, that there's a new, there's a new technology coming out, a new kind of memory. And this is going to be just the thing with the new memory that used to work on tapes. We, we don't use tapes now, but. But now we're, there's there's a new kind of memory that acts like tapes. So uh, I find that there's very little in 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 the art of computer programming that that actually I think is not going to be interesting 50 years from now. Did you think it would be finished by now? Yes, I thought it would be finished by the time my son was born. <laughs> How uh, old's your son now? 55. <laughs> <laughs> What do I take from that? Did it did it get away from you, or oh, did the goalposts move? Or well, it certainly the goalposts move. But the thing is, one of the things is that I'm a very bad estimator. I mean, if if I had known what was involved, I never would have started. I would have been foolish. That was the same for you know Ziegler's giant bar. If I had, no, I, I eventually had to feign sick to my stomach, but I, I wanted to do it and finish it. And now I'm going to write as much as I can. Or, before I die, but maybe I'll go see now. Uh, the topic I'm writing now, it started out as, as one chapter in 1962. And I, I threw it in as a sort of a side chapter because I, this was the stuff that I thought was the most fun to do, and it didn't and it didn't, wasn't a, a big part of computer science at the time. But I thought, but I thought it was I liked it, I enjoyed it, so I I couldn't resist putting in a chapter. About it. Well, in the middle of the 70s. The topic of this chapter, combinatorial algorithm, was covering more than half of all the articles in all the journals of computer science were about combinatorial algorithms. And, and these are the algorithms where you have so many possibilities that uh, the first way you think of solving the problem it is way worse than, 
than, than a good solution. So on the other hand, we think they're never going to be a really good solution. So people always have to come up with a better and better ideas for the combinatorial algorithms and dealing with our, our appetite for if we can solve a problem this big, then we want to solve a, a bigger problem. And so people talk about what the uh, combinatorial explosion as, as what happens when a problem gets big. To me, a combinatorial explosion is what happens when the field gets big. The amount of things I had to put in my book was exploding. And that's why I, I took time off to write tech. Does the book feel like, you know, a friend or a, or a lover, or, or does it feel like an anchor? It's interesting enough that once I get going on it every day, I'm happy. But I do have to warm up at, at the beginning and say, oh my goodness, another day and my book isn't written. <laughs> Another book Don Knuth has written is called 316, Bible Texts Illuminated. Now, John 316 is perhaps one of the Bible's most famous verses. So Knuth chose chapter 3, verse 16 of every book in the Bible and subjected them to his unique analysis. Does being a person of faith in the, in the world of science and mathematics ever, like, does it ever rub the wrong way? Is that an easy well, thing? Uh, I don't know what people say about me behind my back, but but I, I remember when I first uh, told people that I was writing a book about faith and religion, this was in, in the middle 80s, I, I, I sort of felt like I was coming out of the closet because, because most of my colleagues, well, it, it's they kept it to themselves. Uh, and the reason, I think, is because so, so many... Um, if you listen to talk shows in America, you can, you, you hear all, all kinds of would-be leaders of religion that that have crackpot ideas, and so looks like you either are uh, very naive or or intelligent or something like this that that they're myths and so on. On the other hand, when I started looking at this this project that I that I worked, which which involved taking samples of what the great religious thinkers have said over the centuries and trying to boil it down the way I boiled down a, a description of algorithms. I, uh, um, I, so, so I went to the great theological libraries and I studied, uh, and, and I had this idea that if you take a random sample of literature, you, 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 you can uh, learn more about the topic per unit time than if you let them come to you and, t and tell you what they think. Instead, yeah, you, you dive into something and you say, well, what was written about this? And, and so I decided computer scientists know that random sampling is a very powerful method for, for working with stuff. And, and I, I had to use it also as a teacher. Students give me long term papers, and, and there's no way I can read every page of the term paper. So I have to sample pages of the term paper and decide how good the term paper is based on uh, on reading a few pages of it. And so I said, well, what if we do the same thing with the Bible? The Bible is a complicated thing. Let me let, let me take one verse out of every book of the Bible and see what people have said about it. And uh, so, for example, um, John Calvin wrote uh, 80 volumes of commentaries on the Bible. I never looked at any of Calvin's work, but if I decided to, what did John Calvin say about Genesis 316? I, I, I chose 316 because it's the most famous verse by a number. In American football games, people come and they have 316 on the sign. So, so I figured, okay, that decision's made. I'll take chapter 3, verse 16 out of every book of the Bible and see what. So, so I find out what John Calvin said about every book book in the uh, So I had to look up 60 pages of, of what Calvin wrote. And I found he was he had insights that St. Bernard did not have, and so, so on. And so I found this was interesting. And so the way it, it, it worked for me, I, I have uh, always been sort of a liberal conservative in that is I think uh, some people are so smart, they aren't humble enough to realize what they don't know. And uh, I feel that, that God not only exists, but doesn't want there to be a proof that God exists. Uh, because because once there was a proof, that then God would become dead. And people would memorize the proof, and and, and 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 there would be no putting themselves into it. So, so, so I come to this uh, idea that God wants there to be mysteries, and wants me to uh, try to explore them and, and and find out what how to resonate with with God's will. Do you feel that God communicated that notion to you in any way? I, I sometimes uh, sometimes I have a feeling that I'm called to do things. And uh, but but I don't have dreams or anything like that. You know? uh, and I know a lot of people 
describe things that I I, I don't think they were faking. I, 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 like you know, Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, uh, he believed in seances. I, I I think he was being taken in by very clever magicians. But anyway, he's a very intelligent person and so on. But 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 to me, anyway, I I don't claim to, to know or have proof of, of of things. But I also don't believe that there are disproofs either. So for for me. It's, uh, I find that I would feel my life was incomplete if there wasn't something that I could surround and know that, that I knew everything about it. On the other hand, I also think my life would be incomplete if there weren't things that I would never be able to surround and, ne- and never understand. And so I, I sort of uh, celebrate the fact that some things are beyond my ken and still worth uh, trying to grow into. Did the 316 project, the random sampling of verses and then the yeah. analysis of those verses, strengthen your faith? Yeah. Yes, it did, uh, but in different ways. I mean, it didn't. I wasn't at, okay, the beautiful thing about it was not that it, taught me more about the Bible, but it taught me more about the secondary literature of the Bible. Because, as I say, I could read Calvin's works and other, they're typically well indexed, and so you only have to read a certain part. So, so I, I could learn about the history of scholarship and, and how some, and so I, I could come to my own assessment as, as to some people are, somehow had a spiritual gift and others uh, were playing academic games. For example, but I do, you know, have emotions and feel sometimes that that something uh, that there might be this this other world. You know, in, in quantum mechanics, there's uh, there's this idea that once you measure something, that, then you've lost that reality is more than than anybody can can actually uh, know. You've been lucky enough to meet and work with some of the some pretty clever people, some of the really big names in, you know, yeah. people like John Conway and things mm-hmm. like that. Are there any of those people you've met who've kind of blown you away and thought, oh my goodness, this is an exceptional person? I mean, there are so many people that blow me away. No, I, 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 I'm in awe of you mentioned Conway and and Ron Graham was another and Lovas Stanley. But a lot of my a lot of my close friends, I'm really look, I'm really fortunate that I that, that I have them to uh, to learn from all the time. But I also don't believe in the great man or the great woman's the thing. I think the way mathematics and computer science grow is it's not that there's these these pillars, but it's really more like the Great Wall of China. I'd like to put it this way. Um, one of the great computer scientists, uh, Professor uh, Urs Hartmanis, who, who died last year, was chair at Cornell. But he was interviewing me to maybe come to Cornell in 1965 or 66. And he said, Don, what was the greatest thing discovering computer science in 1966? And um, I had to think for a minute. <laughs> and and But I thought it was a great question. And so every year I sort of asked myself, what is the greatest thing that was invented in computer science this year? I can always think of something five years ago. And I can always think of lots of things from five years ago that were, that were important. But I, I, I rarely think of something that... But the thing is, after 10 years, the whole field has changed. And so it's not what's the greatest thing. It, it, it's that all kinds of stones have been added to the wall every year. And now computer science is a incredible structure. And in 1960, when I started, we had less than 100 things <laughs> in, in the wall. Are there any things on the horizon, stones that are going to be added to the wall, that, you're, that you really want to see before your time's up? Like, like, are, there any, are there any things you're thinking... Or, or, or beyond, yes, or beyond yeah, computer science. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, uh, the exercises in my book are numbered, and anything that has a number more than 45 is on my list of, of things that I think are likely to be uh, good stones to know. <laughs> in buying 4B, which came out last year, I suppose there were about 40 of those. Is there anything that you wanted to accomplish or you know, crack or figure out or publish in that that you, that you never did, okay. anything so, that beat you. When I got to my 80th birthday, I wondered what was there left. I also spent, spent time writing a piece of music that I had thought that, that was sort of uh, a call to write. And so I I could only uh, thank God for li- living at a time when I was able to complete, you know, there weren't world wars that were keeping me away from from these things that uh, I, I was able to, I was able to finish uh, getting all of my collective papers into into one thing, and the only thing left was to see how much more of art of computer programming I can write before, I, uh, you know, because it, it, it's something that had so much more has been discovered since I started. So now I'm in this position where I can. I can say, well, I have nothing to complain about if it turns out that 
have get an incurable disease, whatever comes up. I've had more than my share of breaks, and there's no reason for me to to to, to fight or, or or complain about it. But meanwhile, what can I do with with what with what I do that sort of is most orthogonal to what other people could do? Uh, that's my decisions right now. Is to is you know I've, I've got stories about computer science algorithms that I think I I would love to tell, and and I hope they'll be able to live too. I'd love to do it. I've got a couple of questions from viewers that I'll throw at you and you can make what you want of them. But there's one more question from me that I really wanted to ask you because it's something I find very interesting about you. And that is your attitude to being wrong, wrongness. Mm. Because you famously have these cute payments you make to people mm. who find mistakes. You have a website where you're constantly publishing your mistakes. You're making them public. Yeah. I got this wrong. I got this yeah. wrong. You're always correcting yeah. yourself. So in that res- respect, it feels like you're someone who's very comfortable with your humanity and the fact you get things wrong. But on the other hand, the fact you go to so much trouble to find the mistakes wow. tells me that you can't bear to be wrong. So I'm trying to figure out how you feel about the fact that sometimes you get stuff wrong. I know that anything complicated is likely to be, be wrong. I mean, uh, to my surprise, Tchaikovsky hated his symphonies, you know, because he, he kept thinking of think, mistakes that he made in them. But I think my stuff is, is more valuable the more reliable it is. And so the, and so I'm happy to keep betting it more. It's so easy to get things wrong, and, and uh, the ability to fake it, it, it is sort of the furthest from my own uh, from my own goals. I like to also have good writing, and and so I, you know, I'll, I'll try to fix the commas in my writing. But mostly, it's that the facts are. I, I want them to be, be right. I said I, I'm reading this book now, and I find that there, there are a lot of errors in chapter four. I don't have time to write to the author telling him about them. I'm afraid. If it was close to being correct, I would spend a day working on it. But 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 in this case, I I I, I don't have time to fix everybody's error. Just a quick, a few quick questions from people who listen to this podcast. You won't be surprised to hear this. People want to know whether or not Don Knuth has been playing around with putting his toe in the water with the likes of Chat GPT. Right. So uh, last week I had a conversation with Stephen Wolfram about about this, and I decided to um, to ask twenty questions and made up the questions as I was biking home in advance. So I didn't want to b- build the questions based on what the, what the answers were going to be. And I designed the questions so that they would bring out different kinds of talents that needed to be in somebody mimicking human ability. Anyway, out of the twenty, I don't know if I should publish these. I, the thing is, I don't want to. I don't want to spend any more time of my own life on the time on this because I, I, I that'll take time away from writing the out of computer program. But maybe I should because because I, I you know I, I wrote to Stephen showing him that you know the answers that that I got and also my comments on the answers and I was I was blown away by. Five of the answers, actually, um, by the because it surprised me that it was able to step back and understand itself as much as, as much as as it does. What about the other fifteen? Three of them are pretty bad, and two of them are funny, you know, and and uh, and, and the, uh, the, the math was bad. But they, but my, my main uh, comment is what I. S- I think they aren't telling people, they're telling people that, that the way chat G- GPT works is based on, on just a large language model of, of saying what's, looking at, at what everybody has written and, and saying what's the most probable thing to say. And I claim that that is, that they are, they are holding back. That, that's not, not, that's not even nearly true because it's way better than, than what people do. 99.9% of, of what's been written is, uh, let me not use obscenities, uh, but, but anyway, it's uh, uh, low quality. <laughs> and uh, but ChatGP is better than my first drafts. I, you know, I, I go through and polish my first drafts so that I can get them to look to have the kind of rhythm. I mean, the, the sentences are not only grammatically correct; they have rhetoric, they have style. And it's 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 something that only a talented wordsmith does. So that they have not only trained it on what people say, but they have added quality controls for, I mean, these are controls in the sense of conforming to a, to a good style. And they probably understand at least 500 sty- different kind of styles. One of the styles is how to write tech, <laughs> well, uh, but w- one of them is how to write haiku and other sonnets, other, other, other poetical forms. But, but they also, one of my questions was, give me a recipe that, that, that uses blueberries, granola, and wonton skin. 
and it came up with with something that was perfectly in the style of recipe. It, it say you know preheat the oven to 350 degrees. And they captured all of the all of the aspects of the style of a cookbook <laughs> in, from this one prompt. And most cookbooks aren't that good. There are more questions here, but you've answered enough questions. <laughs> you've answered enough questions today. <laughs> you've just, you've earned a rest. I, I, I love I, I love your questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's episode. You'll find plenty of useful links to do with today's topics in the show description, as always. I'm Brady Harron, and you've been listening to the Number Five podcast. If you'd like to hear more, a really useful thing you could do is support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash number file. But of course, the most useful thing you can do is subscribe to the podcast on your player of choice. If you've done that, thank you. If you haven't, well, please consider us.